is Ellen Bench, and uh, I'd like to welcome you to Introduction to Homeopathy. The reason that I teach uh, this particular class, Introduction to Homeopathy, is because um, despite the success and the safety of homeopathy as a uh, respected form of medicine in the world, here in the United States we're still asking or meeting people every day that say, what is homeopathy and how come I've never heard of it? And if it really works, um, is it safe? And uh, what is it about um, homeopathy that uh, differentiates it from herbal supplements and uh, seeing a naturopath or an acupuncturist? Or for that matter, um, what's the difference between getting a conventional medical treatment? So the reason I'm here tonight is to be able to um, introduce you to homeopathic principles. The best way to learn about homeopathy really from the beginning um, is to learn a little bit about medical history. So I'd like to um, expose you to a little bit of that tonight. But um, I'd like to know why you're here. Is there anybody uh, in the room tonight that's familiar with homeopathy, has used homeopathy? Is this a new word for you, a new concept? Um, does anybody have any questions or can you tell me what brought you here tonight? Specifically, um, my brother has ALS and I'm wondering if there's anything that would help him. Plus, I just want to learn more about natural, just staying more healthy than I, than I am. Great. Thanks for coming. Go ahead. Um, we have three kids and I think there's a lot of ways that we can help improve their health without going to CVS and getting something over the counter. Okay. Any familiarity with doing um, what's considered non-conventional or alternative medicine? Sure. Well, again, Laura kind of has guided us over the years. <laughs> so I'm, I'm feeling like we kind of need to take this on ourselves to learn how to do it without always going to her and asking. Okay. All right. Thanks for coming. Anybody else with a question or a Comment, you're grinning. You got something? Not a skeptic. <laughs> Did you say not a skeptic? Somebody's arm twisted is what oh, you no. <laughs> Well, maybe twisted. a little bit, but uh, no, I'm, I'm definitely open-minded to this, uh, for sure. Okay, did you have a question? I was interested, I heard about your vaccine kit and um, how that works for children. I haven't vaccinated my children yet. And, okay. Um, I just wanted to know about mm, you know, some reasons. I came up, I all of a sudden became allergic to things and I've never been allergic to like pet dander or um, certain just like shampoos. And I've, bro I've broken out in eczema and I, I've never had it before. I just wondered if there was some natural remedy to heal that instead of using cortisol creams. And sure. Okay, thanks for coming tonight. Anybody else with a question you want to make sure we cover? Yes. Um, is, is it Alvedic? Is Indian medicine, uh, you know... Ayurvedic? Yes. Is that any, have any similar theories? Um, all alternative medicine mm -hmm. um, has a similar theory. So if we take um, medicine as a, as, a, as a group, when we look at medicine as a big pie, we get um, divided, uh, conventional medicine with alternative medicine. Mm -hmm. And the real difference truly is um, our intentions and our tools. So if we were um, to travel along this a line, being in health inside the circle, healthy, happy, content, sleep good, meet our goals. Um, when we get stressed, let's say that we get a letter or a big bill in the mail and that makes us worried and we don't sleep, then it's worry, don't sleep, cranky, irritated, and then it becomes something like uh, the extension of this being an ulcer and on an antidepressant or anti-anxiety drugs and miserable or unhappy or uh, developing things like allergies. Um, the more we medicate when we do um, traditional medicine, um, the further we get away from balance. So we get some relief in the moment, but there's side effects to these drugs and we um, uh, increase our disease over time. If we do alternative medicine, when we get out of balance and we begin to manifest pathology mentally and physically, what happens is that um, acupuncture, Ayurvedic medicine, um, naturopathy, homeopaths, what we're looking to do is move you back toward a state of balance. So we want to minimize the symptoms and we want to medicate you less and less. 
we want to move the state in totality back to a place where you're healthy and happy. So in the case of medicine, what, um, what we're doing is we're treating or medicating, giving relief in the moment. Some of these um, drugs last like pain relievers four hours if you're lucky and you have to repeat the dose. You don't necessarily, it doesn't heal back pain, it just makes you not feel the pain. Okay, that's, that's, that's medicating. When um, we're gonna use something like a homeopathic remedy like Arnica that works as an anti-inflammatory, it gives us relief that's permanent so the next day we'll be in less pain. And the next time we repeat it, we're in less pain. So we need not only less, but we solve the problem. We don't ongoingly medicate. So alternative medicine, every um, field in what we call alternative medicine is working toward a common goal. We work well together, chiropractic, uh, massage therapy, all of us are looking to move you to a better state. Okay? When we medicate, let's say that we're doing high blood pressure medicine, what we have to do is every 12 or 24 hours you have to take that drug. And the effect of the drug is what we call suppression, which is the enemy of us and uh, the group of us that do um, al alternative medicine is we don't want to uh, create a suppression. We don't want to cover it up. We'd like to resolve it. So the side effect of taking a high blood pressure pill every day over a 10 or 20 year period could be things like congestive failure and enlarged heart. Okay, so what we want to do is not go that direction. Now what the AMA does, in my opinion, that's um, genius and where their talent truly lies and the use of their education is in emergency medicine. If any one of us got run over by a truck, that's where we're headed, okay? We don't want to be sewn back up. We want that emergency care and it's the um, nothing offered like it with their tools and their facilities. Um, what um, physicians also are, are enabled to do in this country is surgery. We, as most of us that do alternative medicine, can't um, own a scalpel, much less use it. So they do surgery. The other thing that they have that we don't have is their um, diagnostic tools. So they have MRIs and blood tests. They have ultrasounds some really great tools. The tools that we use diagnostically in things like oriental medicine, um, are we can use um, some of the maps on our bodies. We can use um, feet like a reflexologist would do or tongue diagnosis um, like the oriental medicines do. We can use iridology for the people who are into um, doing that level of diagnostics. So we have lots of diagnostic tools but not on the same level as the machines that are provided or the um, doing things like a CAT scan. So what the AMA um, does poorly is treatment. Once you get diagnosed with things like diabetes or infertility or high blood pressure, the only tool they have is medicating. So it doesn't resolve the problem, it just gives you momentary comfort or momentary, and could be in the case of you know high blood sugar, high blood pressure, that may be life-saving in the moment, but over time it's detrimental to your health. So um, what we shine at is resolving problems, minimizing treatment, or actually, like I said, altering your state so that your blood pressure comes down, whether that be from diet or nutrition or um, a homeopathic remedy. We're looking to move the opposite direction, okay? And that's what really splits us. Did that answer your question? Well, yes, and it brought another question. Sure. The Arnica, you're saying, so you're using it. So in your use of something, Yes. Um, and you said it'd take care of your back pain, not just for today, but for... You're going to re resolve the inflammation. You can also resolve the fact that you don't hold a chiropractic adjustment homeopathically. Okay. We can deal with chronic disease as well as acute diseases. Okay. All right. So, and it, and the medications, I mean, because both of them are medications, but... That's not true. All right. Um, so in the realm of um, homeopathy, we don't want to, and I can teach you and show you the differences um, about the difference in medicating and resolving a problem, okay? So I like to use uh, this tree diagram that I drew when I was in school 20 years back is that 
when we look at this tree, the tree has a root, and that root really um, is about um, what we know of medicine as genetic predisposition. The root's going to determine whether you're blonde hair and blue eyed or whether or not you're large boned or have predisposition to heart disease. So this genetic predisposition exists for the tree as well, whether it's going to be a rose bush or an oak tree. Above that we have uh, uh, the influences on health, which are diet and environment. And in this particular case, um, if for the tree, it's whether the tree's overcrowded, whether the soil is any good, whether they get enough water, um, whether um, it's a parasitic environment or not. These things are influence on health. Um, at diet and environment are really um, tools, the only tools that we have any control over. Um, it's not uncommon for a physician to say or recommend um, uh, that you move to Arizona if you have asthma, that you'd be less irritated in that environment. It doesn't get rid of the asthma, it just aggravates it less. You can also see that in this part of the country is let's, how about you move out of the moldy basement, okay? It's aggravating your breathing or creating um, bronchitis or issues with pneumonia and allergies. So we can adjust this environment. We can put HEPA filters on the house. I don't know how that saves you when you go outside in the spring, but um, it is an influence on our health. It may minimize the aggravation. In the case of diet, we can eat good food, we can eat bad food. You can drink like a fish, you can smoke. Those things influence us in a positive or negative way. The, the, the problem with treating at an influential level is that it's a lot of work. So what happens is that if you've been advised not to drink milk, don't eat chocolate, don't eat sugar, white flour, stay away from gluten, what happens is either you're not happy anymore <laughs> or the minute you cheat, the result is that now the disease is your fault, that you have indigestion or that you have allergies or that you have gas and bloating, okay? So this gives us some level of control of these influences on health. From this place, this genetic predisposition, who we are, we come through those influences and then we can poke out symptoms. When we do that, if we treat and medicate them, they mutate to a new form. So medicate means cover up to use something synthetic. Medication in our environment in the United States means it's been patented and owned um, by a company that profits by the fact that you're gonna take that pill. Um, they ha they um, are giving you relief of the symptom, knowing that ultimately it has a consequence. All right, so here's what happens. Is if we take a healthy child as an example, and we're gonna vaccinate them. When we put the disease matter in their body, the body starts to react and they get a fever. So they'll get cranky, weepy, feel lousy, and get that fever. Their body's trying to fight that contagious material off. So when that happens and we use some Tylenol, it shifts it now to where the child now gets the rash. So he's red, hot, irritated, now on the skin instead of having a fever. So if we take and we rub some cortisone cream on there, what happens is the next time the child gets sick, it's something worse like asthma. So now we're going to put that inflammation down in the lungs. And what are we going to use to treat asthma? Yeah, some more steroids. That'll work. So we're going to use some steroids and we're going to treat and medicate every time the child can't breathe while they are continuing to have less and less good health. Okay, we've now created a chronic disease instead of an acute problem. So now what happens is after we've used the steroids for the um, a breathing problem, then what happens is they develop a more serious skin disease like eczema. So now we're gonna see chronic skin disease and what are we gonna put on that? Some more steroids. So what they do now is they play cat and mouse. They alternate until they're into young adulthood with using their inhaler or treating the um, skin condition. So now what happens is that supposedly after all these years of suppressing, covering it up, medicating, 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 now when they go into adulthood instead of growing out of it, which is what we're told happens, now we're going to have chronic sinus problems and allergies the rest of our life. So we've just moved the disease around, making it deeper and deeper and more and more chronic. So the depiction of that is that we have these two scales representing our vitality. We have our scale from zero to 100. This side is vitality, this side is disease, and we split our life force between them. So what happens is, is that if you're not feeling good, overstressed, didn't go to sleep, drank too much wine, the next morning you're gonna feel lousy. 
So we're going to have pathology on this side. We're down to 90-10. Now if you'd get some sleep, take some vitamin C, sip on your echinacea, whatever it is you're going to do, and go to bed early the next night, you probably will recover. If you medicate it, you maintain it. So the more that we medicate or do things like inject vaccine, disease material into the body, to be able to fight that off and our immune system to be active in defending it, we lose vitality, it lowers our vitality. Now what happens is, is that the evidence of this is that the kids are unhappy, they're snotty, they're belligerent, they're hard to get along with when people don't feel good. The evidence that this theory is true is any one of these things that we can undo and remove, this comes back. So we can actually use homeopathy to eradicate disease. We're not just medicating the state of it, we actually can undo it. So if we go back to our drawing here and we actually go back and antidote the ill effects of vaccines, then this resolves. So if we get disease where its origin is, we actually can shift the state of vitality. So it's different than medicating. If we want to use homeopathy and herbs and supplements and acupuncture, we can treat all these things acutely. We can go to the, we use a, a remedy for pain relief. You can go to the acupuncture when your heels hurt and you can't stand on them in the morning. You can take coenzyme Q10 and some fish oil because you're afraid you're going to have a heart attack. We can lower our cholesterol and do some red rice yeast. We can do, we start medicating all the body parts. Okay, we can do that with homeopathy. We can do it with herbal medicine. We can do it with any form of treatment where every time something's wrong, you go run, try to fix it. The difference is, is that we're not creating a suppression. Okay, we're taking care of it in the moment. We're getting relief for the moment. The potential and the glory of homeopathy for the, all of us who practice classical homeopathy is to look at this totality of symptoms and go, what the heck is wrong here? What can we do? Can we go in and clean up this never well sense so that we can give this person relief instead of treating allergies so that you're not taking a homeopathic remedy every time you're snotty or having to take herbs every day to build up your immune system? How about we just go in here and clean this mess up? So we look at it a little bit different. The potential of homeopathy is a, a little bit unique. We see classical work done in acupuncture to some degree if they're trained classically, but they, you have that potential. Um, they're taking uh, account of what your organs are doing, what your manifestations are, not just the symptoms. So if we go in here and we say, let's antidote the ill effects of the vaccine and wipe this out so we don't have to medicate it. Then we're looking at this, that gee, you have some issues with circulation or uh, getting a little bit breathless, not the vitality you used to have. We can say, gee, if there's a genetic predisposition toward heart disease, how about if we direct our remedy to that genetic predisposition? We can look at somebody in their totality mentally and physically. So the minute you're not afraid, that's your first clue you're in better health. The second one is to get rid of the blood pressure or the high cholesterol or whatever it is that you might be doing that's showing that you have disease. Okay? and actually get rid of the symptoms because we're healing it, not because we're medicating it. So the glory about uh, all of us who have done any kind of classical homeopathy as a patient and gotten results is that it's, um, for the most part, considered permanent. And I'll give you an example. Um, I um, was a, a fairly unmedicated um, child. I wasn't sick very often. And when I got into adulthood and um, active in, as a businesswoman, um, I was busy enough not to notice that I hit 30 without ever getting pregnant. In the meantime, I'd made my normal visits to the gynecologist, and um, despite the frustration level of um, not getting any good answers about what was you know, mal malfunction junction for me or pains or different problems that I had through the years, is um, that my body obviously wasn't working right and I wasn't making any progress. So um, after using the conventional tools to tell me things with an ultrasound like you have cystic ovaries or uh, maybe your uh, blood shows your hormones aren't completely perfect, the offer to me was to do surgery or to be given chemicals. 
uh, and that wasn't appealing to me. I said, you know, there's a belief that I have that I should be able to get my body healthier. I should be able to function normally. So um, I um, got a um, referral from um, one of my um, subcontractors who said um, that they had tried an infertility doctor. So I went to see this infertility doctor, and the first question she asked me is, how much meat do you eat? And I said, I eat a lot of chicken. She said, you never ovulate. It's full of estrogen. So she wanted to load me up on chemicals, too. But I bailed out of there and went straight to the health food store, which where I um, uh, frequented. And I asked the woman to, uh, for a book or a referral about uh, nutrition. So I began to read about nutrition. I changed my diet. I did everything that you could possibly do that was all, probably off the deep end. I went to macrobiotic camp for a week, learned how to eat rice and seaweed. You know, you name it, I tried it. And the result is, is that I did get healthier, but I didn't get pregnant either. So ultimately, um, my husband come down with the shingles. And by now I've done the kahuna healer, the acupuncturist, the naturopath, you name it, I tried it. So she said, why don't you see a homeopath? And I thought, you know, here, in my opinion, it was just one more nut and an investment, okay? It's not cheap either. Um, so I went to... Uh, take my husband to this um, big commercial clinic in downtown Los Angeles. It was, it was a, quite a ride for me. And um, he went in and he sat on the table there on the exam, in the exam room with his shirt off. And the doctor walked in and took a look at him and goes, man, you have shingles. You're going to have those every time you're stressed out. The pain can last for months to years to come. And here I have some cortisone cream. And I said, wait a minute. I had a little card in my hand. I said, I'm here to see this homeopath. He said, oh, he said, I'm in the wrong room. He left, wow. and the homeopath comes in. He takes one look at me, he goes, man, he says, that's pretty painful. He said, but don't worry, it'll be gone in a couple days, and it won't come back. I said, whoa. So he wrote us a prescription. We went down to the homeopathic pharmacy and filled it, and uh, he did really well with it. So I called this doctor back on the phone myself, the homeopath, and I said, I'd like to uh, make an appointment. So when I went in to see him, they set me in his office, uh, which I thought was peculiar. So he asked me what I was doing there, and I began to boo-hoo and told him I was there for infertility. And he said, um, uh, began to ask me questions. And I would say that that went on for infinitely. See, a couple hours he asked me what I would consider to be were multiple, unrelated to my situation, moron questions. And at the end of that, um, he wrote me a prescription for a remedy. So I went down, I bought the homeopathic remedy, I told the pharmacist, I'm not putting that in my mouth, the guy's whacked, and I want to know exactly what it is before I touch it. He never looked between my legs, didn't do an exam, seemed all far out to me. So I took home the, um, my book, and I opened it. Um, luckily for me, he sold me a good book, and I was able to assess and look up the remedy and see what it was and what it did. And in our Materia Medicas, they list um, what the remedy is made from and what the mental and physical symptoms are by body parts. So it lists the uh, problems, the negative, all negative, all negative problems that you might have mentally. And then uh, go to, it goes down, head, ears, eyes, nose, throat, all the way through to all your bodily functions. And I had most of them, which really irked me because uh, I couldn't figure out how he could assess that from the dumb questions he asked me. But I thought, what the hey, I tried it, and uh, I felt like a million bucks. So the interesting part about that is I go back to work and I'm a busy woman. I had 25 employees and busy, okay? So I um, get pregnant, pretty fabulous. And I didn't really attribute it to the homeopathy until I got pregnant immediately after. So then I realized that my body not only worked, but what was fixed was, you know, obviously no longer broken. <laughs> so I have um, two girls. They're now 21 and 22. They've never been to a medical doctor their entire life. Oh, that's not true. I had, a, I had them in a home birth. And um, I did have an old physician that backed up that home birth and did some well baby checkups with him. But the kids haven't seen a doctor since. They've never had a cavity. They've never had an antibiotic. They've never had a dose of Benadryl. So um, homeopathy is not a casual thing to me. I have passion about it. I wanted to raise my kids. Um, 
um, healthy. I wanted them to have great diets and the best food I could afford. So I moved to Montana. The girls had some good open spaces and we were able to raise some of our own meat. And um, I'm really lucky. So it works for me. When I moved to Montana, I didn't know a soul and um, started uh, working on the neighbors and anybody that I could offer help to, including their animals. And I've been teaching homeopathy ever since. So this is my 18th year in private practice, my 16th year of um, teaching. And I um, teach every level of homeopathy. Um, whatever the questions are and whatever the um, style of the group is, whether it be practitioners or whether um, it be a group of uh, chiropractors or massage therapists or uh, moms, um, homeopathy is useful at each and every one of those levels. So what I'd like to do um, is tell you a little bit about what homeopathy really is and what makes it different, what sets it apart from things like um, herbs and um, uh, diet type therapies that you might be familiar with. Um, homeopathy um, was started about um, 220 years ago in Europe by a um, physician by the name of Samuel Hahnemann. And uh, Samuel Hahnemann was um, a chemist and an educated man. He was um, multilingual. And um, his um, frustration with the kind of medicine that they were doing in his day um, um, was um, motivated him uh, to ask more questions. He was um, a deep thinker, in my opinion, and a philosopher as well, and said things like, why is the use of the medicine or the treatment making people um, less healthy in the long run? Why is the long, their long-term quality of life um, not as good as it was before we medicated them. So the medications of the day included things like um, silver nitrate. And for any of you who use colloidal silver, it still falls in that category. Um, for using mercury, we still use that in our teeth, uh, as well as, as a defoliant in things like our irrigation systems, even knowing it's a known poison. They did bloodletting, and bloodletting was um, not um, at all unpopular. We actually lost George Washington here in the United States um, by bloodletting for tonsillitis. So these um, treatments of the day, um, turpentine for things like bronchitis or pneumonia, um, things like tar um, for eczema, I mean, they were really pretty barbaric. Now, um, Hahnemann said, um, that this wasn't really making him very happy or very comfortable, and he actually quit uh, um, practicing medicine. He went back and hit the books and began to translate um, scientific and medical journals uh, and uh, for a living to feed his family. And he began to write about disease and philosophize where disease was coming from. At that particular time, the beliefs of the day included things like that um, disease um, was actually a curse or some kind of punishment. So they didn't understand about um, genetic predisposition. They did not have microscopes to look at bacteria and pond water. They had uh, no idea the difference between a bacteria and a virus like we have the privilege to do today. So um, he wrote about things that he uh, perceived um, to be a, uh, a problem that there was, in fact, genetic predisposition. I drew that for you in the tree, that there was some reason that um, people were more vulnerable or susceptible to disease. We still use all of his philosophies today, by the way, in the medical manuals. We still um, make reference to those names he gave genetic predispositions and the uh, categories of the di of diseases that they are. Um, he also said that there's a contagion. There's some reason that people get sick. He brought inroads to medicine. We still use uh, simple things like wash your hands. If there were germs or bacteria and you went from woman to woman like a gynecologist or um, an obstetrician would today, that more women died by births, medical deliveries, than they did by midwife deliveries because they were contaminating um, one woman to the next by not doing things as simple as washing their hands. So when Hahnemann was able to teach um, the doctors and the scholars of his day things that, uh, that he was able to observe, medicine um, began to change and evolve. Now, <clears throat> um, what Hahnemann um, 
did too is while he was um, reading other people's works, there were concepts that re reoccurred, like like could cure like, or using minimum doses were as or not more medicinal than these strong, powerful doses of drugs or poisons that they were using as medicine. So Hahnemann got his opportunity um, to give that a try during a malaria epidemic. And um, malaria is commonly treated by quinine. In that day, it was uh, known as chichonia bark, but the extract out of chichonia bark is quinine, as we use it today. Um, but Hahnemann took that quinine, and he got sick as if he had malaria. So he repeated the experiment when it wore off, and he got malarial symptoms again. So he treated um, his colleagues as well as his family and guinea pigdom, and they all got sick as if they had malaria. So he was spurred on at that particular point to um, uh, try other substances, but the deduction was that um, what we're using to treat could also cause disease symptoms. Um, so what happened is, is that he also discovered that in this theory of being able to try uh, the poisons of the day, which were medicines, we don't want to take I or my children, if I was experimenting, to try mercury. We are, they already knew it was poison. He didn't want to eat that, along with turpentine and anything else that they were using as poison. The poisonings of plants, of belladonna or arsenic. Not a popular idea to want to take that home to your wife or your family. So what Hahnemann did is he diluted the remedies down, or the substances down, and produced from a physical substance um, now what we today call a remedy. And how he accomplished that was by taking uh, the original substance in the, in the lab, and remember that Hahnemann was a chemist, so this I'm sure is completely natural to him, but we're going to use the substance arsenic, and what Hahnemann did was diluted the substance or made it, or actually made it soluble. He dissolved it and made it soluble. We refer to that as mother tincture or pharmaceutical zero. If we weren't using arsenic and we were going to use something like chamomile or... Um, any other squeezings of a plant or could uh, e even uh, dissolve and make soluble metals or, or minerals, we refer to that as mother tincture. Now, <clears throat> to make a remedy, what happened was that Hahnemann took these sterile vials, put 100 drops of water in each and every one of them, and began the dilution process. He removed one drop of arsenic and put it in that first 100 drops of water and then shook it hard with a lid on um, the process we call succussion, is uh, shaken vigorously or pounded. Now when he removed that, uh, finished preparing that first dilution, we removed one drop into the second. So in math, we're going to refer to that as 1 over 100 to the second power. We're going to take uh, out from the second to the third and shake it from the third into the fourth, five to six. When we get to six, we refer to that homeopathically as the potency 6C. Um, that's, um, what that means is that we end up with the one over 100 to the sixth power. Okay. Now that dilution, if I do it at half strength or half dilution, is that we end up with 1 over 100 to the 6th power is 1 followed by 12 zeros. If we use 6 zeros, we get 1 part per million. So it's much more diluted if I put the other 6 on there. But for, sake of, for our sake, we're going to call this diluted at least 1 part per million. It does not mean 6 cc's like it would if you were going to fill a syringe or measure volume. In homeopathy... It is the, po the potency is how many times the substance has been diluted. Now, the next thing that Hahnemann did that was really unique once he got these materials into a safe potency um, is that he now tried them on humans. We're going to give this arsenic now to a control group, as we do today. And I said Hahnemann guinea pigged his colleagues and his family to do this. But um, what happened was that when he gave them arsenic without telling them what it was, asked them to document how they felt, what they said was, I feel like I've been poisoned. I want to know what you gave me. I don't trust you for a minute. I don't feel good. I don't like this. It's making me 
feel like I have burning in my throat or when, you know, in my rectum when I go to the bathroom. I'm not happy with this. I think that you should stay right here with me and, you know, help me. So what do we do with that information? Unique now to homeopathic remedies are mental symptoms. We now know the mental um, for each and every one of the substances that we have as remedies. These people were able to say, I'm afraid of death, that they felt like they had burning pain, <clears throat> that they were restless and anxious. So now, what do we do with that information? What medicinal value do these mental symptoms have? They now allow us to use the remedies with, with much more width and breadth than we do with things like an aspirin. We can now give them to people who have had chemotherapy, who are, have taken a known poison under the pretense that they're going to die and are afraid of death. They're sick and thrown up and have burning pain. We can give them relief with the substance made from arsenic, one part per million, one part per billion. The more we dilute these remedies, the stronger they act. So we can um, use these uh, super diluted substances and affect people both mentally and physically. We can give them relief of their disease in multiple planes. Now we can also use this information to do acutes. So we can use it for something casual or we can use it for something that has deep pathology. So Hahnemann went on to prove a lot of remedies. They proved um, belladonna. They diluted down that mercury to see what else they could do with it. That they could um, um, actually get rid of infections and that they could um, get rid of symptoms of senility even with things like mercury. So <clears throat> Hahnemann's um, um, success was um, well known very quickly. Um, the epidemics of the day um, were treated successfully with homeopathy. Now what Hahnemann did in the meantime was actually made uh, what we know of as our first inoculations. If you wanted to prevent something like cholera or you wanted to do prevention for malaria or the flu, he could make a remedy by super diluting the substances of the disease themselves. They were the first immunizations. It, they were so highly successful that there's still uh, statues today to Hahnemann in Washington, D.C. for what he did, uh, what homeopathy did, because he's passed on by then, but what homeopathy did uh, for the population um, in saving so many more people than were treated with um, conventional medicine. So um, what happened in his day, in his lifetime, the end of the 1700s now, early 1800s, is homeopathy became popular really fast. Who um, had health care in the late 1700s? The rich, okay? So um, the royal family in England became uh, patrons of homeopathy. They still have a homeopath um, as their primary care provider today. So um, as the rich began to seek out Hahnemann and his staff and other doctors that were converting their thinking along with him to doing um, this practice of using ultra-diluted substances to do prevention as well as treatment. It was non-toxic, it um, was highly effective, and there were no side effects. The speed at which the remedies worked were phenomenal. Now, as a result of that, um, the um, uh, politics of the day in Europe into the 1700s was exploration, if not occupations of countries all over the world. So homeopathy was taken by the French and the English to Africa, to India, to the United States, uh, went uh, to South America and to Mexico and all over the world. So homeopathy has been used in these countries, including this one, um, since the end of the 1700s. Now in the United States, the first medical college um, in our country was homeopathic. It still stands in Philadelphia today, and it is called the Hahnemann College of Medicine. It has since, um, in the 1900s, um, gone, uh, been taken over by the AMA. Um, the first research hospitals in the United States were homeopathic, and homeopathy was well known and highly effective. You could see a homeopathic physician um, at the rate of about 50%. If you wanted to see a conventional um, doctor, you could, but if you wanted to see a homeopath, they were commonly available. There were homeopathic specialists here that did gynecology and dentistry and ophthalmology. The homeopathic books and all the clinical information has been stuffed in rat holes in these hospitals.
that are currently, for the last 20, 30 years, being dug back out. But homeopathy was very popular here and very effective. Now, what happened to homeopathy, and how come you haven't heard of it, is some um, the, the beginnings of our country as laws are beginning to be passed by Congress. Um, the AMA actually is, um, from, business, from the business point of view, probably a lot more progressive um, than uh, the homeopaths were. They went to Congress and they passed legislation that said cancer couldn't be treated by anything other than an AMA provider. So cancer is actually owned mon or um, serviced only by the AMA here. You can only treat it with chemo, surgery, and radiation. You cannot treat cancer in the United States. All the cancer clinics, despite their um, validity and their success, were closed down. If you want to treat cancer today in an alternative way, you have to leave the country. The clinics moved over to Mexico, or you have to go to Europe, or there are some Canadian clinics as well, but we can't legally treat cancer in the United States. Um, the next thing that happened is that they took dominion over the words treat, medicate, and prescribe. We can't use those either. In the alternative field, we can recommend and we can give you advice, but we can't diagnose, treat, or medicate or mess with your medicines. So um, what happens is um, the age also, um, the Industrial Revolution, created this environment of us thinking in a, what we consider to be a very physical or scientific way. What Hahnemann taught us is that the reason that these remedies work in super dilutions is we're actually getting the remedy to go to our life force, our vital force, is what animates a body. They all have um, flesh and they all have, you know, you could have just eaten dinner. The difference between somebody li alive and dead is whether they have a vital force or they don't. Now the remedies in these super dilutions actually have an effect on that vital force the balancing and the motivating agents of our bodies. So that wasn't necessarily a popular opinion of the day, and it certainly wasn't very popular when the Industrial Revolution here in the United States was big. We're trying to do everything uh, from our physical understanding, and uh, the tools begin to arrive. We now have microscopes. They can look at disease in that microscope. They can see bacteria and viruses. And when they put a homeopathic remedy in a super dilution, one part per billion or smaller, they couldn't see it. So they accused homeopaths of using placebo despite the fact that the results were outstanding. People were happy doing homeopathy. The effects were obvious and well documented. Um, in the meantime, um, we, the FDA has formed all homeopathic remedies still today are FDA approved. The homeopathic remedies were the original United States pharmacy. They still are today. There's never been a recall ever of a homeopathic remedy. Um, and that creates some level of competition. At the same time that these laws are being passed, we pass patent laws. Now the patent laws, and the reason this is significant, is it changes medicine as we know it. Instead of using um, natural substances which are not patentable, because the patent laws um, say that um, to own or to have, possess a patent, you have to do something unique. It can't be something that already exists. You have to develop something new. So if we have um, arsenic already exists and calcium and magnesium already exist, and um, chamomile already exists, comfrey for those of you who use those herbs, um, you can't own them. So what the pharmaceutical companies did is they actually, to make them unique, is they studied, now that they have those microscopes, identifying the active ingredient in a substance. So if we can identify that what is an anti-inflammatory about white willow bark, then we synthesize it. Then we sell it back to you as aspirin. So drugs are patented. The pharmaceutical companies own them. That's why the prices are what they are. They can charge whatever people are willing to pay. In a homeopathic remedy, because they're natural substances, there are no patents. You can still buy a remedy and um, the Mart stores or the health food stores or even from us as homeopaths for commonly 10 bucks. So, um, we're not, you're not paying for that uh, research and development. Ours is already done. We know what each and every one of these substances does mentally and physically, but they're not patentable. 
So what happens now as a result of that is that it becomes business to sell medicine. Now to make a biz medicine into business, it takes some partners and it takes some thought. So if we're gonna make some business alliances here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have you go to the doctor and you're gonna tell the doctor that you are all achy and have pains all over your body, that you're having difficulty sleeping and that you're miserable. So they say, aha, that's called fibromyalgia. So then what they do is the insurance companies step in as a partner and they give it a code and they're only going to pay for a designated treatment. The pharmaceutical partner says, okay, here's the way it's going to go. You're going to get that muscle relaxer, a pain reliever, uh, some Ambien so that you can sleep and an antidepressant. Now this is going to come in a box nowadays and that's called the standard of care. The insurance will only pay for this product provided by only this guy. So they become business partners in medicine. Now, while they're looking at this homeopathic remedy under the microscope and can't see it, they bash the tar out of and create campaigns in the United States to bash all other providers that aren't part of this group. So they didn't pay for chiropractors, they did things like called them quacks and home, they shamed homeopaths into using whatever those was on those stupid little sugar pills like placebo. Even though they worked, even though they were effective, even the homeopaths of the day had trouble defending what the heck was on those and how to get it across because we didn't have this money source here. So what happened is homeopathy really dwindled in the U.S. between 1920s, really, and 1960s. And in 1960, everything changed. In the 60s, we have now um, a common flights over to Europe. We've got transportation. If you went over to Europe, uh, for the young people who went to school there or studied there, if they went into the local pharmacy, they could buy something like Oscillococinum, which is a remedy made um, for the flu. It's the um, most uh, effective prevention in the world for the flu. And also treatment in these little local pharmacies and markets that they could buy homeopathic remedies or were recommended and begin to get some experience and bringing them back. At the same time that that's taking place, the MRI comes on the scene. Now once we have an MRI, and which is, uh, does magnetic imaging, they put the remedies in the machine and they can see it. They can see that the remedies not only had uh, action, some kind of um, wave that they could measure, some kind of um, what could be known as uh, uh, frequency, but they could see the difference in the potency of something being low potency versus high potency. They could tell the difference between the substances and homeopathy took off. Now in the United States um, today, the, me the medicines that are available to us or the forms of medicine are wide open. You can see the kahuna healer, you can go to the acupuncturist or the naturopath or the crazy homeopath and get some uh, alternative forms of treatment. We've been validated, they can map, they can see these acupuncture points. They can actually measure through that MRI what's happening um, after um, you or during um, those types of treatment. So um, we've been validated by their technology. And the more technology we have today, the more valid homeopathy becomes. Because as the equipment gets more and more refined, um, the evidence gets more and more, like I said, measurable. Over and above the fact that the people get great results. I mean, that's, that's the biggest. But homeopathy um, today in the circle of alternative medicine that's available to you has now overtaken in popularity what the AMA is providing. When I started this in the 80s, the late 80s, um, the stats showed that 78% of the American population were seeking regular um, AMA provided care. In the year 2000, it went to 50-50. This, in the, these years, after 2010, we're over that. So it's really a significant thing that people are not happy with the results they're getting with 
uh, um, traditional medicine or conventional medicine. They want some other choices and it's the reason I'm teaching it to you is because there are options. There are uh, homeopathic remedies as a category are highly effective. FDA approved known as medicinal substances that can give you relief from both acute and chronic diseases. We have an effect the uniqueness that we're going to use remedies instead of drugs or herbs and the difference between drugs and um, or herbs and um, having just a diet alone is that those substances you swallow you're going to dissolve them in your belly. You may or may not assimilate them. If you take calcium and you have osteoporosis, it doesn't cure the osteoporosis. You may or may not even use the calcium you put in your belly. When we use a homeopathic remedy, they go under our tongue or in a mucous membrane. We can put them in your eyes, we can put them in your, uh, on your skin, we can um, put them for the cows and the dairies on their vulva, we can spritz the animals in their faces where they're um, you know, have, have um, any kind of moisture, that, like, like in their eyes and nose. So homeopathic remedies actually in those mucous membranes have a totally different action. They go to your brain, they go to your nervous system, they go to the origin of that vital force. The, and they tell it to move. If the vital force recognizes the message like we use um, like your, if your brain was your battery, is it if it's if it has um, a charge, it will respond to the remedy. So it works very much like starting your car. If it's sitting outside and it's got tires and gas, but it's not moving, it has everything it needs to run, but it's not. It's stuck there. So what you do is you turn that key. The key provides a spark. The spark lights the fuel, and you get the car moving down the road. And it'll move until you get where you're going or you run out of gas. That's what a remedy does. Is it actually wakes up and motivates the system to do what it's had intentions to do in the first place. It's supposed to digest food. It's supposed to be healthy. It's not supposed to be depressed and full of anxiety and have sores on your body. We want rid of that. We want to motivate the body toward health. The plan is that you have some awareness of what illness or, and, and health is, that we know and have evidence of that you do have movement, that it gets rid of pain or it gets rid of mucus or it gets rid of a staph infection like MRSA, which the poor AMA couldn't touch with a 10-foot pole. They have no idea how to solve these problems. When they tell you things like you're going to be a diabetic the rest of your life, it's because they don't know how to fix it, not because you're stuck. We can motivate the body with remedies, okay? And um, change your state of health. So the world of homeopathy is humongous. It's a huge field of medicine. The only thing that we can't do is surgery, and we don't want to. Be really nice to not need to. And if you need to, we're gonna send you to the doctor who's good at that, right? To a surgeon to take care of it. But homeopathy, um, is uh, highly effective in this w a huge width and breadth of medicine. We can do things like they did for me to give me uh, my whole body and my being a tune-up that fertility was possible. What's impossible in homeopathy is to do birth control. Can't do it. Can't make the body broken. <laughs> it can only make it work. It can't make it not function. There's no side effects to homeopathy. We can't cause a miscarriage. It can only fix them. So the, the limitations for us are we can't medicate. We're only going to make an improvement. We're going to facilitate your body to be the best it can be. If it comes, if your weaknesses come from things like genetic predisposition, we're going to empower it to the best of our ability. That's where herbs and, and good diet come in. Let's support that and maintain it. Let's give it the best we can to empower and give people strength, and vitality, so that they can maintain that state of health. But the goal is to create movement. Our plan is, when we use a remedy, is to set an intention to create movement. If you're here in this place of healthy, happy, asymptomatic, we're not touching you with the 10-foot pole. It's a wonderful spot. If you bump out of it after you get that bill and you have worry and don't sleep, 
and it's a worry, don't sleep, cranky stomach ache, and then that stomach ache's becoming an ulcer, and you're not getting along at home and at work, it's, you're going to either start taking something over the counter or, or seeing your doctor, or we're going to create some movement here. We're going to move you to another state because it's uncomfortable. So as you use a remedy, you'll have less and less of these symptoms with a plan using classical homeopathy to get to a place of better health. Okay? All of us experience our disease pathology differently. It creates a befuddlement because I have 2,000 remedies with me in my pharmacy. Which one do you pick? If you go to a health food store, they have 50 or 100. What are you going to do? So the reason for teaching in communities like yours is to teach things, uh, empowerments, like how to use the top 50 remedies. What are the keys to them? How do you select a remedy? How do you recognize in your children what it is that you're really um, um, uh, giving them the remedy for? In the case of a child, what's the first symptom of them not feeling good? Whiny, clingy, droopy, they're miserable, they don't eat. So at that particular point, the disease all uh, starts out as a mental problem, right? It has mental symptoms. It's followed by snotty, um, throwing up, or diarrhea. If you can get the disease when it's only this big, we can move them back to balance with little or no effort. If they start to produce mucus and they start to cough, now we got more work to do. So to move them back toward balance, we're going to change their vitality, get rid of the symptoms, and improve their health. But always, um, for chronic diseases, the mentals come first. And if the mentals don't change with the remedy, you've missed something. You're not getting the maximum um, state of improved health. If I give you something like, or you go to a medical doctor and you get something like alcyclovir for herpes, what's the next medication you're going to be on? Anti-anxiety drugs. Because it puts the ulcer on the inside. So now what happens is that you get frantic or have pain. That's why these poor shingles people are so miserable. They rub the cortisone on their shingles and it flips over and now they're irritated on the inside and they can't get to it. They're in chronic pain. So, and the followed by the fact that they can't sleep anymore, then they need some kind of me sleep medication. Then the anxiety is created. To cure the anxiety, we bring the shingles back. Put them back on the skin, the anxiety goes away, and then we get the shingles off. Mm. Is disease that we have today that they call aging, or the horror of things like autoimmune diseases in our youth, is from over vaccinosis. We're putting disease in and packing it in at a rate that's obscene. When I was a kid, we had five vaccines before I went to kindergarten. The kids today get 22 before the age of two. They're chronically sick. They're not casually sick. It's not doing disease prevention. It's actually undermining the immune system completely. The theory was homeopathic. A little bit of the snake that bit you. A little bit of light cured like. We didn't give people disease. We gave them ultra-diluted essence of disease. It's non-toxic. We didn't put polio on their body. We gave them heads up, don't get polio. The homeopathic immunizations are in the 90th percentile of effectiveness with no side effects. They do great prevention. We're not making people sick under the delusion that being sick makes you healthier. Homeopathic vaccines, would they, are they recognized by... Yeah, and they've been around for the last 200 years. Document, document, document. We have documentation. I'm, I'm just wondering, can you use that if you were putting your child in school? Why not? It's a, you, and there's no... The only vaccines required by law in the United States are yellow fever if you visit Africa and Gardasil if you live in Texas. <laughs> no other vaccines are mandated. No, no other vaccines are mandated by law in the United States. Not by law, but by like let's say by the Trump. It's called intimidation. They just try and make you. They want compliance. Why do they want compliance? Why, when you take your child to healthcare, do they want that vaccine certificate? 
They want it because the person providing the daycare is getting reimbursement from the federal government for their food program. And that's the requirement. If you're going to get reimbursed for these children eating ketchup as a vegetable, then you have to have them vaccinated. You have to have their vaccine card on file. If you went to somebody that fed your children healthy food and didn't get government supp you know, supplementation, or you wouldn't need it. And when you go to the school, the, um, the uh, Constitution allows us the right to raise our child in the way that we're empowered to by God. So you can sign a religious exemption. Right. You can also do this, and this is um, 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 my opinion, is, and some of the things that I've done in my own experience is raising my own children, is you can also tell your pediatrician, I will consent to, uh, to, the, to the concept of vaccines for my child as long as you're willing to be liable for it. If you're willing to sign a document that says when my child gets sick or suffers from any chronic effects that you're going to be responsible, they won't sign that form. Okay? That's the end of that. That's how you get a medical exemption. Okay? Or that in your family there's histories of chronic diseases like autoimmune diseases, like um, some of the new things like autism, seizure disorders. If you don't have some of those in your family, I'd be shocked. With a familial history, you're qualified for a medical exemption, which is permanent. Okay? So you just have to be able to know um, the facts about vaccines. I also asked them if vaccines are safe, why did the Congress dedicate a fund for the side effects and damage from vaccines? because they know that a percentage of the population is going to get sick and damaged. Now, the uh, irony and the politics of that is that they write off a percentage of our children knowing that that, is, that isn't totally and completely the truth. In, our, in my area, and that this was um, you know, kind of a new idea, I homeschooled my girls in the first um, years of their life, but in going to my um, community daycare, which I did, and he used it with some um, frequencies. The woman called me on the phone and she said, the group of children um, here in our school and in my daycare have whooping cough. So I need to contact all the parents and let them know. And the um, reality is, is that they're blaming it on a non-vaccinated child. So the non-vaccinated child who had whooping cough gave it to all the vaccinated kids who were supposedly protected. Then they had the teachers at the school um, take antibiotics because even being after being revaccinated, which they encouraged the community to do, that didn't provide any protection either. So they put them all on antibiotics and blamed the homeschool family. <laughs> so then they said that it was a bad batch. Well, there's nobody that's a native at that school uh, to the state of Montana. The kids are from California, Oregon, Pennsylvania, you know, Kentucky. They didn't all get vaccinated in the same clinic. So that was hogwash too, okay? So this, um, um, these campaigns that they have to bash people who are unvaccinated are really bogus. You just have to have some backbone. You have to do some research. There's many books on the history of vaccines, the um, efficiency of homeopathic um, immunizations, and you just need to brush up and be prepared. Okay? You can um, choose to um, be compliant or non-compliant by filling out your piece of paper, one multiple forms that are available to you. Um, but it's always under attack because they want compliance. Okay? It's not that your child has protection. What they want, in my opinion, is compliance. What would be the homeopathic kit then? Originally it was five immunizations, now it's 22. It's repetition. But the um, um, children's vaccine kits or children's birthing kits or um, the family kits, all these um, selections of remedies have all been put together for you. So the children's vaccines homeopathically include um, the MMR, the diphtheria, pertussis, and tetanus. Um, the chicken pox, the generic antidote to um, the ill effects of vaccines, which produces huge amounts of mucus and allergies in our children. So those selections, oh, hepatitis B is also included in that group of remedies.
So they're available to you. Yes. I'm sorry. So is that so? I, I didn't do the research, and my kids were all immunized. Okay. What would we? I mean, not either. Well, ultimately, if you you can do individually unimmunize them um, by taking away the ill effects, but what you real at the same time you're going to protect them with the homeopathic vaccine. So you can do them in dual. You can antidote the ill effects in the body. Now what's happened to the dis children's diseases and the results of these immunizations is that we've mutated diseases into new forms. So we're calling diseases now by new names. We've renamed things that are commonly, um, were commonly known. What's MS? has the same symptoms as polio with a slow onset. It's mutated. So in, in, in children that have hearing problems and reoccurring ear infections is from the measles vaccine. The measles and mumps vaccines are live. What's the mumps? It's a glandular disorder, yes, an infection. So uh, now what we have is um, a swollen gland someplace else, chronic lymph enlargements, huge tonsils. So the diseases have just been moved. We call them by other names. Who ever heard when we were kids of RSV? What happened, to, what happened to arterial sclerosis? It's now coronary artery disease. Every 10 years as they reassess the liability of these drugs, they come out with new ones and the diseases evolve into new names and new manifestations. The truth is, in the vaccine class that I teach is a totally... You know, it takes a good three hours to get through that class is to learn the manifestations of these diseases. But we've taken something like a staph infection, and because of antibiotics, we've moved it into all these different kinds of infections. They all have different names now. So we've done the same thing with the diseases our children are vaccinated for. And we have threats that are really scary. What's an autoimmune disease? where the immune system is actually so overwhelmed it's not functioning properly. It's broken down. If the origin of these autoimmune diseases, one of the main categories of the origin of that disease is vaccinosis, is where the vitality is diminished because the disease side is stacked up. We're going to put all these drugs and diseases in the body and this vitality goes down as a result. When it breaks down, when you bump that 60-40 mark or 50-50 mark, it breaks. It can't handle it anymore. It's going to convert this into malfunction. Okay? So the goal is, is to minimize the amount of diseases we put in our body. Now when you go to the market and some child is slobbered on the handle that you've going to push in your shopping cart with that recycled air for which staff strap things like spinal meningitis are airborne? Are you protected from disease by having these vaccines? If you get on an airplane and somebody's hacking, coughing, choking, etc. in there, does, are you protected from those diseases? So what, how, how is it that you either get sick or don't get sick? It's a direct result of where you are in here because diseases are ever present. When you go to get a sandwich and the person goes like this when they're wrapping it up or putting your mayonnaise on, are you being protected from disease? Or the fact that they didn't do wash the dishes good enough for you in the last 400 people who use the silverware are leaving some germs behind for you. How are you going to protect yourself? By, you can't isolate yourself. And you really can't avoid being exposed. How your immune system works is to be at its maximum or top functioning. So all of us that do alternative medicine are looking to improve that vitality. We want evidence. We want to know that instead of you being at a two vitality when you get out of bed in the morning, that we could achieve four, five, six, seven. Right? 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 We want to feel great. We don't want to be snotty. We don't want to be always wearing mini pads. 
How many women, if you go into the market, how many square feet are dedicated to something you have to put between your legs because you're dripping? <laughs> it's, a, it's really obscene. How many of the adult uh, have sinus infections or chronic dripping of their nose? It's that we're sick all the time. Just call that normal, right? It's possible that I know someone who's had allergies their entire life. She's only 25, and now she has developed symptoms of MS. What that is, is that's a weakened immune system, right? And wherever her genetic predisposition and her imprints are that allow her to have weaknesses and strengths, her weaknesses are going to be in her nervous system. And we know by the combination, I know by the combination of those two, that it's kidney related, okay? So kidneys are for which the nervous system is regulated from or influenced by. So MS is nervous system and allergies are kidney. So they're highly related diseases or the origin is related. And you can that. You can undo disease based upon the person's vitality, the level of suppression and how willing they are to you know, do um, what we call classical treatment which is to treat the totality. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to undo disease process with acute remedies or substances. You can't cure MS with herbs either. You're, if you put them in your belly, you have to go after the origin of disease and respect the totality that you're treating. So people like classical acupuncturists or classical homeopaths have that mentality, is what's the totality? What's happening here and how do I shift it as a, as a, as a working unit? Okay, how do I undo this disease process? So that's considered what we call classical thinking, is totality. We can teach you to do remedies for your family without creating suppressions by fixing bug bites and um, uh, injuries and cuts and trying not to um, burns, that you can do those things inexpensively and painlessly with great results. Um, how to stop bloody noses, which is really a chronic problem, not an acute one, is why would you have the tendency to spring a leak? <laughs> later, later in life, the people who have blood, the people who have spring, uh, you know, spontaneously bleed. What about later in life having hemorrhoids or the um, blood clots? I mean, they're real, it's, it's a sign of a problem. It's just a, a considered to be small in their youth, but it is telling you and warning you of signs of having a weak circulatory system. So there's more to the story. There's more meaning to these symptoms when they're accumulated and looked at from the big view instead of symptom by symptom. So how do you learn to diagnose that yourself as a lay person who doesn't have all the information that you do? How do you learn to start You come. You don't, first of all, we can't treat, diagnose, or prescribe. So we can't do that at all. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to take an assessment of your symptoms and then make a decision based upon your history and your current symptomology. If you happen to have access or bring things like lab tests or let's say that you've been told that you have a cyst or a tumor of X size, then by using the remedies, we want to see that your overall well-being improves, that your symptoms diminish, and you can use your doctor to monitor the size of that tumor to make sure, or cyst to make sure it's shrinking. So the tools are not incompatible. What's incompatible is the treatment. If we're going to cover up or suppress a problem instead of resolve it is where we have conflict. Now Harman, when he came up with these homeopathic principles, did some politically incorrect things. Um, what he said is that if you cover up a disease manifestation only to make the body sicker later, that's not health. And that's not what doctors should be doing. So ultimately he made a huge field of enemies. Because anybody practicing medicine who uses drugs that suppresses a problem, then is, um, according to Hahnemann, is doing bad work. So what I'd like to say is that that um, unpopular opinion that um, that uh, MDs don't want to own is is the fact that when you ask for help, your bladder's leaking, and you take a drug for uh, to stop the bladder problem. 
What results next is additional kidney issues or kidney disease, a more chronic problem. It's beside the point because he gave you what you asked for. You asked for relief. It's his intentions weren't to hurt you. His intentions were to give you relief of what you complained about. If you go in and have pain and they give you a pain reliever, the fact that you get constipated or lethargic or can't get out of bed the next morning or can't operate machinery at work for the next three days because you're drugged is beside the point. You ask for pain relief. So what we do in homeopathy is resolve the pain without the side effect. How about if we get rid of the pain and you can operate machinery and don't have constipation? Their intention isn't necessarily bad. The result is bad. And what he was trying to do is educate and separate out what the origins of disease. Where is disease coming from? How do we resolve it? He, his intention wasn't to bash the AMA or the medical doctors of the day. It was to educate them that there's more to disease and there's consequences and there's a new tool that we can use to not create a suppression. So the AMA and homeopaths have been split from the very beginning because of it. Yes? Um, I've heard of Arnica. Um, what's the difference between um, that and Tiger's Balm? Um, a tiger bomb, uh, uh, products that carry things like uh, or contain things like camphor, menthol, eucalyptus, tea tree oil are aromatic substances that are actually um, bronchial dilators. The reason that we want to rub Vicks Vapor Rub on our feet or on our chest is they open up your breathing tubes. Okay? So they are medicinal substances in their own right, but they're incompatible with homeopathy. They won't work together. Now, the difference between you rubbing that aromatic um, tiger balm on, a, on arthritis is that it doesn't resolve the arthritis. You have to rub it on there multiple times a day, like you would take an aspirin. So it gives you relief that way. It's temporary. If you used a high enough potency of arnica, you could get relief that has great longevity and start to resolve the inflammation. And it doesn't smell bad either. <laughs> well, um, like when your husband showed up, that guy, you know, and saw the shingle. Yes. That was a quick, he didn't ask all the questions that he asked. Well, he, uh, he asked him oh. 10 questions. Okay. And to figure out which remedy he right. was going to use for right. the shingles. And he, but it wasn't, a, it was a 10 minute consultation instead of a two hour consultation. Okay. So, because he treated it as an acute. Mm -hmm. Oh. He didn't treat it as a chronic disease. What I had was completely different. Okay. What I had is why is my body not functioning right. properly? Right. So let's see what it's going to take to clean out any old junk and create a tune-up. Because okay. he, because the shingles were showing up as some, right, acute, mm -hmm. and so he was, so but he's still trying to find out mm -hmm. what is the problem with why this person is having the shingles. He didn't in that appointment, and they never came oh. back. Oh. But remember, their remedies have mental and physical symptoms. Okay. So let's say that he had anxiety for some reason that led to him having that outbreak. Yeah. So whatever remedy he used quelled the anxiety so he didn't get shingles oh. back. Right. Because he might, your husband might not have placed himself in that stressful of a situation. As not necessarily because we open the mail every day. Oh, <laughs> okay. So what happens when we use a remedy that changes our chronicity of disease, it changes our perception. So if when the mail comes, you say one more piece of mail and I'm going to jump versus, okay, okay, I guess I'm going to make payments, is the difference in where you're at in this scale of disease. Okay. It doesn't keep the mail from coming and it doesn't mean that he's not going to be in a stressful environment. How many of you have more than two kids? Does that change? No. <laughs> but whether you yell, scream, flip out, mm -hmm. kick the, you know, th throw things is where you're at on this scale. Okay. If you say, hey, let's everybody sit down and we'll all do 10 minutes to get this taken care of. Or on this side, you go, you know, you scream and get everybody in the yard while you're cussing and slamming and banging the, you know, unloading the dishwasher. It's different how we solve the problem. But the problem's the same. The motivation for the problem is still there. The instigator of the problem. Okay. Right. And and the problem is on a progression if it isn't taken, 
Possibly. Well, what happens is, is that you can stay in the same state over and over and over and over and over. The, where you get in trouble is when you start medicating. Oh, okay. If you take a high blood pressure drug. So here's what people say to me. I say, what can I do for you? What brought you here? I say, well, I just had my annual checkup. I went to the doctor, and the doctor said, uh, I told him, asked me how I was doing. I said, you know, I'm having trouble. I'm a little bit breathless. And um, uh, the doctor says, well, um, did some looking at him, and he says, you know, you have an enlarged heart. He said, well, why do I have an enlarged heart? How'd that happen? He said, well, let me look. He said, you know, you've been on high blood pressure medicine for 20 years. You've or you've had high blood pressure, he says, for 20 years. So the fellow says, I don't have high blood pressure. You've been giving me pills for 20 years, so I didn't. Huh. So the covering up of a smaller problem created a much bigger one. So now what's he going to do? I mean, now you've got to deal with that state. Right. And the proof that this stuff happens is that they know what's coming next in a lot of cases. So they can actually um, put the two meds together. So now we're getting blood pressure pills with a water pill in it. So we're, call, we're getting some hydrochlorothiazide with your blood pressure pill. Why do they do that? Because when your heart begins to be stressed, you're going to have congestive heart failure. Your ankles are going to start swelling. So how about we just go ahead and put the hydrochlorothiazide right in the blood pressure pill so it hides the next symptom. Where this becomes a problem is when our elderly or older people go to the um, doctor or the hospital in the winter. They can't breathe, they can't lie flat in bed, they have anxiety about their um, state, they're coughing, and um, they start giving them antibiotics as if they have the flu. And it do, they don't respond. So what's really happening is the nurse comes in who's trained to look at their ankles, and she looks at the ankles and she says, there's no swelling, writes it on the report, that it's not congestive heart failure, it's the flu. So they're still non-responsive to the antibiotics. You're going to lose them. They're in trouble. They've got pneumonia. So what I tell my patients to do is, the family, is you go outside in the hallway and you know by their meds because their meds include hydrochlorothiazide, the water pill. So I have them go outside and to the nurse's station and tell them that this is congestive heart failure. They'll come in, they'll test for it, and then they'll put them on something like Lasix and get that water off, but it's not pneumonia. So it creates misdiagnosis because they're medicating the symptoms that would be warning you you're in trouble. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So w the diseases get more and more complicated. And when those complications appear, the style uh, in medicine is to medicate the next symptom. Hence, the Tupperware is full of stuff people carrying around with them. Or those little pill boxes where you could have so many, you have to put them all in there for the week so that you can remember which ones to take. Yeah? So the goal of health is to minimize the need for that. I tell my clients, I cannot take you off your meds. I cannot adjust your medication. The goal is to not need it. How about if you don't have anxiety? How about if you don't have depression? How about if you don't have high blood pressure? How about if you don't have gout? So we can educate them about um, um, dietary things to follow that up, and we can also get rid of why they have the disease in the first place. Okay? I go to um, visit my family, and I have my homeopathic bag. So I just walk in the door, and I live, um, you know, a plane ride away from my family, so I'm not there all the time. And when I open the door, my mother says to me, you have anything in that bag that will keep your dad from leaving his shoes in the hallway? <laughs> and I said, I probably have a remedy in here so you won't notice. <laughs> yeah. And then when I thought about it for a minute, I said, I have to explain myself. So I said, Mom, you know, homeopathy is really um, strange and unique. I said, it really depends on how you feel about those shoes. He said, if you um, feel like dad's being disrespectful to you because you like the house clean and left his shoes there, that's one remedy. If you're afraid you're going to trip and fall over those shoes and get hurt, that's another remedy. If you're afraid the neighbors are going to see the house and think less of you, that's a different remedy. So how exactly do you feel about those shoes? And that's how different homeopathy is, or how unique it is. So when we talk about things like a migraine, which is a medical name for a headache, 
okay, of a certain type. We ask people, well, how do you experience a migraine? So if your head feels like it's going to explode, or somebody else feels like their head is being crushed in a vice, while another person feels like they have needles and pins behind their eyes. So the reason for their headaches also differ. One person has financial stress, one has you know, relationship problems, and one of them ate too much chocolate. So the reason we give the remedy as well as the way they manifest it is unique to each remedy. So there's hundreds of remedies for headaches. It's why you have a headache. How about we get rid of the fact that you have headaches instead of treating the headache? So the possibility of the thinking just a little bit further is the homeopathic drama, right? Is that we're interested in how you feel and how you experience your problem. If you had four children that have a cold or the flu in the house, they all have different symptoms. One of the children has sinus infections. The other one um, may throw up every time they don't feel good and other kids cough every time the wind blows. So even though we're calling it all the flu, we have individual and unique ways of manifesting disease. If we all had a meeting around the table of, for all of you who have those big families, is let's talk about your mother. So we can talk about, you know, one person says my mother was a saint and the next one said my mother was selfish and she had favorites and the other one says that my mom was, um, you know, ornery and picked on me. And you're wondering what family they all came from because we all have our own perceptions of, and dilemmas, both mentally and physically. The uniqueness of homeopathy is that we care about that. It's really similar to what it used to be for an old GP. He knew that your dad was a tyrant and that, that ulcer that you have is from stress. They'd give you Valium. Now you have to go to a doctor for uh, your heart and one for your feet and a gynecologist and a podiatrist and a, uh, you know, it just keeps on going. So the further they take our bodies apart, the smaller they look at it as um, as our DNA, or as the, the, do we secrete serotonin? The more that happens, the higher the side effects. If you stand back and look at somebody's totality, what's the dilemma? What's the consequences that this person's dealing with? And shift that. Then we can resolve and improve their overall well being, not just the headache. Okay? Does that make sense? So, what's possible in homeopathy is infinite. We can learn to do acutes, that's the beginning. And the reason acutes are easier to learn than anything else is because we all experience them the same. If we wanted to do an experiment and we all wanted to slam our finger in this car door right, or this big door right here, this big wood door, what would happen? We'd all have the same sensation. It takes your breath away, you're probably you know, wanting to cry, your finger starts to th throb. Um, you're worried that, that your nail might fall off, you know your finger's gonna turn blue and you're sucking air while you're thinking about it. So what happens is, is that if we can divide the way we treat that for a double blind, we can give a third of you some pain reliever like a Tylenol and you can take that every four hours, but your nails are still gonna turn blue and fall off. You probably have trouble getting your jeans on for three or four days. We can take the other third and give you the homeopathic remedy, Hypericum, and let you use it every five minutes three times in a row, every hour three times, and you're good to go. It doesn't turn blue, your nail won't fall off, and you forget about it the next day. The third group, we're going to use placebo, so those poor guys are going to suffer. Your finger's going to throb like heck. You're going to sneak some Tylenol, okay? <laughs> Because it, it isn't effective. So what we want to do is um, the, recognize that everybody in acute, for the most part, has the same circumstance. If you burned yourself on the wood stove, and got that big blister on your palm, um, everybody experiences it the same. It's going to turn white, the flesh dies, you're going to get a blister. If we can rub calendula on that homeopathically or a burn cream, the pain goes away, it doesn't form a blister, and you you know it's gone in a day or two after three or four applications. You don't have to be miserable. That's doing an acute. We all experience that situation in a similar way. So now we can use the same remedy in these kits that we make for family kits is that the remedies in here are tools for acutes. So you can pick the remedy for um, slamming your finger in the cart, or you can pick the remedy for a burn, you can pick the remedy for a bug bite, and get results for all children in the family in the neighborhood. When we're doing chronic disease like fix my hormones, 
or how about you resolve my insomnia, then we need to know what's personal about you that is in a, that dilemma. Okay, what's unique to you. Then we'll pick the remedy. And then we'll move out of the way while you're doing that, whether that be stress or whether that be, <clears throat> you know, your personal dilemma. So these toolboxes are, are huge. And the reason that um, we use them and encourage you to have them is you can't do any harm with homeopathy. It's safe, it's non-toxic. If you pick the wrong remedy, it doesn't work. If you pick the right remedy, you get results. You only repeat it until you resolve the problem and then you're done. So if that's 10 minutes or you know three days, when you're done, you're done. We don't ongoingly medicate. We try to solve the problem. So then, like one of those little vials, does that have an expiration date? Um, the homeopathic remedies packaged properly don't have expiration dates. They last forever. The only contaminant to remedies is camphor, menthol, eucalyptus. And I profess that tea tree oils in that category, things like oil or oregano, if you're really into essential oils, um, the pungent trees, you want to avoid those. Things like peppermint that um, some of these companies really encourage you to use, um, they don't tell you the whole story. If you're using peppermint for digestion, it causes the sphincters to relax, so it increases you regurging your food. Okay, so if you have reflux, it makes it worse. It might help the digestion, but it doesn't help the, um, you know, the regurging. So there's more to the story when we medicate with herbs or medicinal substances, and knowing the whole story sometimes give you a much better use of it. Things are not just good for this or good for that. They have side effects or they have, um, you know, reasons that they are acting the way they do. So that's why classes are so significant. So homeopathy is a huge field of medicine. We can do many things with it. Um, tomorrow we're going to teach, a, I'm going to teach a class tomorrow uh, called the family class. And what we're going to do in there is we have six hours to learn the top 50 remedies. It's hot and fast. We're going to learn how, what it is that's medicinal about each substance. We're not going to learn everything that's in a book. Is homeopathy is the most documented form of medicine that we have available um, in the world. We know the mentals and physicals and the pathology and the clinical indications for every remedy. What we want to do is figure out how to do that faster. When you slam your finger in the car door or you grab the wood stove and have a big old nasty burn on your hand, you want relief right now. So if we learn which remedy is for burns and which remedy is for the bloody nose or which remedy is for slamming your finger in the car door, you're going to be able to pick it just like that. Okay? So we're going to learn that. That's the family class. The other classes that we have available would be um, alternative immunization classes and learning about the diseases and um, how to um, re-immunize or unimmunize your children from their uh, traditional vaccines. We teach... Um, uh, uh, veterinary classes, how to use the remedies for your animals, as, uh, whether that be a, a dairies or livestock or your pets. I teach an ongoing theory class in multiple communities so that you can learn um, how to use the books and the resources and start asking um, why questions and getting the answers to those questions. What is genetic predisposition? What do I do with it? If that runs in my family, how am I going to handle it or deal with it? How do I stay out of that vulnerability to actually manifest it. You can have a genetic predisposition, doesn't mean you have to get sick. So uh, teaching uh, in those theory classes more and more and more about chronic diseases. I have a class that um, we teach the next 40 remedies after the family class. And that class will be talking a lot more about uh, behavior disorders. Uh, things like jealousy and ADD, um, ailments like autism, and how to assess uh, those cases to be able to make some better remedy selections on a more chronic basis instead of so acute. So there's lots of um, information I'm willing to share with you. Um, just need the interest of the community and we'll provide it for you. Okay? And uh, I thank you for coming. Thank you. You're welcome.